Hello, dear friends. I am just a few hours after um, the 20th of Tevet, which is my father's yard site. So this is a memory of Rabbi Ze'ev ben Meir, the Beit Shochat. And um, I want to mention two things. One of them is connected to this last week's Parsha, Parshat Vayichi, which was the death of Jacob, of course, and his blessings to his children which was the Parsha around where my father passed away, of course, on the 20th of Tevet. Jacob passed away, and he passed away. And um, so I, I want to begin with um, just a few words about the, the story of the passing of Jacob. So there is a Gemara in Ta'anit, which discusses the the death of ya Yaakov in a very strange way, and even the story is told in a strange way. And the story is told to Rav Nachman and Rav Yitzchak. We're sitting at a meal, and Rav Nachman said to Rav Yitzchak, I'm reading in the English here, from the art scroll, let my master say some Torah. We're in the middle of a meal. Give it to our Torah. He said to him, okay, this is why I heard in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan is first generation Amora in the land of Israel. And Mesechim Misuda, you're not supposed to talk during the during eating because you might uh, swallow something in your windpipe. It's dangerous. Okay, hey, doesn't want to say something, not going to say anything. So finally the meal was over. He says, okay, now tell me something. So he said, okay, I'll tell you something else Rabbi Yochanan said. Rabbi Yochanan said, Yaakov Avinu lo mate. Our patriarch Yaakov never died. Rachman said to Rabbi Yitzchak, what does that mean? I mean, didn't they eulogize him? Didn't they bury him? <laughs> what does it mean he didn't die? So, he says, I learned this actually from a pasuk. What is the pasuk? And this pasuk is taken from Jeremiah 30.10. Ata al tira of Yaakov, do not fear, O servant, my servant Jacob, says God. Al techat Israel, do not be afraid Israel, which is Yaakov's other name. Because I will redeem you from afar, meaning the people of Israel. And I redeem you and your children from the land of their captivity. So you see, Jacob is compared to his children. So if there's a parallel between, so if there's children around, then he's also around. That is the drasha. So what is the meaning of that drasha? I think the simple meaning of that drasha, and others have said it too, is not, this is not a discussion about whether the righteous live after death, because we believe that the righteous live after death. We believe that every righteous person uh, and has a place in the world to come. It says, Kol Yisrael Yishleim Chalik Lalem Haba. Every uh, person in Israel has a place in the world to come. We also believe the righteous of the Gentiles, Hasidim Matolam, have a place in the world to come. So that's not even the discussion here. Of course, Jacob has a portion in the world to come. That's not a question. Here he's saying something different. Mm -hmm. He's saying that there's a way that a person continue even in this world. And then it's really Yaakov Avinu Lame. So how do you continue in this world? You continue in this world when your children are following your footsteps and they continue the good work that you did, then you're still alive. Because if the next generation does it and the next generation does it. So when Yaakov heard from his sons that they were one heart with him and they were going to continue walking in his ways, the, the tribes, so that means that Yaakov is still alive and the message keeps going. And as long as his children keep the message, Yaakov is still influencing this world. That's called Yaakov Avinu, low mate. So it's the influence of children, of family, of students. And Baruch Hashem, my father influenced a whole generation in Montreal. Of course, his family members, all of them were influenced. The direct family, myself, my sisters, our relatives, all affected in different ways. The congregants in his kehila, all affected in different ways. 
So this way, we, the legacy continues. Yaakov Avinu lo met. It's a great blessing of continuity, even in this world. It's not a statement about the life in the world to come, which we all believe in. Of course, we believe, as to quote Rabbi Cook, that death is the big lie. Because human life is sort of like going from a caterpillar to a butterfly. You are crawling this world in the, as a caterpillar, and then you will turn into a butterfly to live in a different existence in the world to come. So that's the first thing I wanted to say in his uh, memory. And there's a lot to say, but I will be brief. The second thing is something I was pondering about when I was, went to visit a shiva home of the father of a friend of mine last week. And it's a famous Mishnah, which is read at many houses of mourning, many shiva homes. It's a Mishnah from the Mishnah Mikvaot in the laws of ritual baths of the Mikvah. Because, you see, the word Mishnah in Hebrew is the same letter as the word Nishama, which is the soul. And therefore, there's a custom to read Mishnah at a house of mourning because it's the same letters as the, as the word soul. So we're doing it in order to somehow connect to the soul of the departed. But there's specifically four Mishnayot in the whole six orders of the Mishnah, that the first letter of those four Mishnayot actually spell the word Neshama, Nun, Shemo, excuse me, Nun, Shem, Mem, Hey. And they are found in the seventh chapter of Mikvaot, the Mishnahs four, five, six, and seven, which is unusual. So not only is the word Mishnah, the letters of Neshama, but these four Mishnayot, have the Rashi table, the first letter of each one, the acronym comes out, the word Nishama, which is soul. And it became a custom, therefore, to read particularly these four Mishnayot in houses of mourning. And I had thought about this for a while, and it seems to me there's a dubla entendre going on here between these four Mishnayot of their simple halach meaning and the meaning behind them, which really is connected to the idea of a house of mourning. And I want to try to explain this as brief as I can um, at this point. First of all, I'll say what the Mishnayot are. We have a mikveh. A mikveh in the Torah is a body of natural water. And when a person is um, tamay, a person is impure, they immerse themselves in a body of natural water. It could be a lake, it could be an ocean or a sea, it could be a swamp, any body of natural water. And uh, but the body has to be of natural water has to be at least as large as the size of a human being, which means it usually says three amot a human being is at least three cubits high. It's not very high. It's about one and a half meters in antiquity. Human beings were about that height. Today we're we're higher, and it's one squared cubit around which I guess makes sense to the average human being. And so it's the amount of water to fill that space. Three cubits high, one cubit around. Some people explain that it's enough water to cover a human being in such a cubicle if they got into the fetal position. So it's sometimes explained this way, that way. Of course, if you explain it as a fetal position, it's even more interesting because it's sort of like a rebirth. The fetal position is how the child comes out of the womb of the mother, which is like the mikveh, filled with liquid, and the waters break and they come out. And when we go in the wrong direction, we become impure. We look for a way to rejuvenate ourselves and regenerate ourselves. And this is the idea of the, nukvah, the mikveh. The mikveh is a new beginning. It's new hope and a new beginning. You see, in the Torah, impurity is always connected with the loss of life even if it's in a partial way. This is explained by Rabbi Yudha Levi in his book Kuzari. So, the, in the Torah, the worst type of impurity is touching a dead body of a human being. That's called the Vodah Tumah, according to Rashi. So that loss of life, being in contact with that loss of life, is the highest level of impurity. Then there are other types of impurity. There are certain reptiles, certain animals, that if you touch them, you're also impure. There are diseases like the uh, biblical leprosy, which doesn't exist anymore, which would render a person impure as well. There's also a woman during her monthly cycle 
She's also considered impure. That's a loss of life when the egg gets destroyed of potential life. And a man who has an ejaculation too, it's a loss of potential life. So it's a partial loss of life. All these things, therefore, you go to the mikveh in order to rejuvenate again, re sort of like a rebirth, going through a rebirth type of function. Now, this idea then is this idea of trying to bring yourself back into life. Back into life. Somebody once said, again, Yaakov Avinu Lomate. Yaakov Avinu never died. Life is life. Life is not death. Life In this world, like, life looks like a terminal disease. But life by itself is eternal because that's the idea of being alive. That's one of the reasons why the paradox of this world, being born in order to die, seems like a total paradox. It only makes sense if actually continues in a, at least another form after this world. So you have this idea of the mikvah. Now I want to say what the meaning of the mikvah is the dubla on top. So mikvah is a body of water. Like it says in Breshit, yikavu ha'mayim mitachad l'shamayim al yabasha. It says in the days of creation, let the waters gary, gather together so that the earth be revealed. Yikavu. So the word mikvah means to an ingathering of water. But the mikvah is also sometimes used of the word tikvah, which means hope. In Jeremiah, mikveh Yisrael Moshio Be'it Sarah. The mikvah of Israel will save it in the time of distress. The mikveh of Israel means the hope of Israel, not a body of water. It's from the word tikva, which is hope. And there's even a drashma like this in the Mishnah in Yoma. Mishnah in Yoma, chapter 8, the last Mishnah, Mishnah 9, at the end, Rabbi Akiba says, Ashrechem Yisrael, which means how happy you should be, O Israel. Lifnei miya temetarim, because who is it who purifies you? The one who purifies you, your father in heaven. Because it says in Ezekiel, God says, I will send upon you purifying waters and you shall be pure. And it says in Jeremiah chapter 17, God is the mikveh of Israel, which actually means the hope of Israel. But then he continues, why is God called the mikveh of Israel, just like a mikveh can um, purify those who are impure. The Holy One, blessed be He, purifies Israel. Here he says in the commentary, purifies Israel from its iniquity. So, you have this double entendre of mikveh and mikveh, hope, and a body of water which purifies. So with this double entendre, I want to come back again to these four Mishnayot, and try to understand them from that point of view. Number one, a mikvah is a natural body of water. It is water, if you may, that fell from heaven. It's God-given part of nature. In fact, you cannot make a mikvah for mayim shuvim, man-made gathered water. It disqualifies the mikvah. It has to be God-given. Real hope is not the delusions of man. <laughs> it are the God-given parts of humanity which can bring real hope, which is bettering yourself, going in the right way, and of course, ultimately God leading the world to its redemption. So these are elements and values within the essential character of the world. But there are a lot of man-made delusions, or what I call man-made redemptions, or false messiahs. These are the maim shuvin. These are the man-made waters, which are made there instead of the mikveh, to make feel people feel better, give them a little optimism, but at the end, they always crash because it leads them in the wrong direction. Whether it's communism, or whether it's wealth, or whether it's this, or whether it's that. Different types of secularism. I mean, they're all different types of things which are false messiahs that our people are deluded into. And these are the false mikvahs, which are called the mind shu'uvi. 
So it says in the first Mishnah here of the four, that if you had a mikveh, and the mikveh had already enough water, which is called 40 se'ah, but the color of the mikveh changed, it's better not to go into that mikveh, unless you can go in the part of the mikveh where the color didn't change, which is interesting. There is 40 se'ah, it is a mikveh. Once a mikveh is a mikveh, you can add to it, maim shuvim or anything. So what does it matter if the color changed? So somebody threw a little wine into it, it became reddish, but it still is a mikvah with 40 cell. So it's better not to. If there's a place where it didn't change, if the other half of it, which is also 40 cell, then go there. But if this half, which is 40 cell, um, changed its color, don't. Because then it doesn't appear. It appears like an illusion. Sometimes even the right ideas, if they appear wrong, you have to explain them until people understand them. I've always said the Jewish concepts of redemption, which are so important for mankind, have gotten such bad marketing over the few last few generations that people don't even understand what it's all about. Um, I've said many times, Judaism is not messianic, it's redemptive. It's not about this person or that. It's a tango between the Jewish people and, it, and between the Jewish people and God. And that tango is about how the world should be rectified because we have a task to do. It's not messianic, it's redemptive. Very important point. There's always leaders. You need leaders because people need leaders. What can you do? Most people are not self propelled They need a leader to take them. So there'll be a, yes, of course, there'll be a leader for the house of David. Hopefully a good leader. That's the whole point. Somebody with Belief in Emunah and Ruach HaKodesh and knows what they're doing. Divinely inspired. You know, when you have good leaders, it helps the whole generation. We have bad leaders, everything goes backwards. It's amazing how much damage you can create in two to three years when you're a bad leader. You know, destroying is much, much easier than building up. So even when something is real and it is rainwater, it should at least look like rainwater then people get the wrong idea, you have, which means you have to explain to them what it is and why it's the right thing. So they don't think you're another deluding individual. It's a lot to say about that. I'm going forward. Number two, which means, let's say you had a mikveh, which, which was missing through, only through three lug out of the 40 se'ah. And then wine or milk fell into it. Okay. It, this mikvah can still be redeemed if three lugim of natural water fall into it. And the fact that wine and uh, and milk fell in, that's not considered maim shuvim because it's not water. It's, it's man-made water which dilutes because water is trying to say that this is going to give you life, this is giving you hope. Those are the uh, things which are dangerous to real redemption. Other things are not dangerous. Somebody says, take wine, make you feel good, but everybody knows it's not a long-term thing. Have some milk. You'll you know, be, feel a little bit healthier, maybe. That, that's not the problem. The problem is the real delusions, the fake messiahs. Those are the ones that make the mikvah, not the mikvah. So here, yeah, eventually there'll be more water. That's not going to change it. That's part two. Mishnah three. Mishnah three says, if you have exactly 40 se'a, which is this measurement, as I told you, of the three cubits by the one cubit, how, to, how much to fill it up. You have exactly that amount. And one guy goes into the mikvah, and another like, guy is coming out of the mikvah, and the guy who came out of the mikvah, the water's still on him. So he took out a little amount of that mikvah. It's not, a, it's not anymore 40 se'a because a minute amount was taken out by that guy which is still stuck on his, uh, I don't know, his bathing suit and on his body. Or if he went in without a bathing suit, still on his body. And it says, as long as his feet are touching the waters of the mikvah, it's as if the water that's on him is still in the mikvah. If he moves away, then yes, that mikvah doesn't have 40 sa anymore. The way I interpret that is, is also, we all have to get, in the end of the day, the concept, a redemptive concept, really means we've got to do it together. We're all connected to each other. So one can help the other. 
That's not a problem. If we move away, it becomes a problem. Mishnah number four. I'm saying this quickly, but I think you're hopefully you're getting the idea. Mishnah number four talks about what if I had a mikvah, which was like a swamp and had just enough water. And then what I did was I put in um, a sort of bed into the mikvah because I wanted to make the bed pure. But when the bed goes in, it has mud at the, at the bottom. So by the time the mikvah is in, the mud is covering up part of that um, part of that uh, of that bed. So uh, is that bed actually pure? And uh, and what about and if it's not pure, does it affect the mikvah? So basically, the Mishnah says yes because the legs went in first and that became pure, and then the rest of it went in. But then the Mishnah adds another thing. What if it was just a very thin layer, layer of water over this mud? But there's enough water there for the se'ah, but it's just hard to dunk yourself in it because it's a thin layer. So what you can do is you can take items and push it into the water, that way making the level of the water rise, and then you can go into it, which means human beings can help, and things in this world can be well, because we can use this world also to promote the goals of mankind. There's nothing wrong with having values. You can use this world. If values are good, they're good for everything in this world. They're good for people. They're good for the things that are in this, in this world. We don't have to worry about them. So basically, in my opinion, these Mishnayot are also symbolizing this idea of redemption, because the neshama is the part, according to the Kabbalists, is the part of the human soul which is always pure, which is never tarnished by our sin. Elohai neshama shanatata bi we say in the prayers in the morning. The neshama, the inner soul that you made God, is never tarnished, it's always pure. So there is a goal, there is a way to purify the world, to bring it to a point of understanding, of actual peace, of ending war, of creating mutual responsibility and understanding, but people have to work together and they have to use the assets of this world in order to work together and not leave the assets for, for evildoers. And they need to create goals in which they, and goals which are not deluding goals of just people have self-interest to delude everybody out to all the different types of false messiahs. And it also has to be a goal which is understandable people we have to explain sometimes what the point is why we need the jews back in israel why we need this connection uh, to jerusalem how will it help the rest of the world to give them some type of light which will give them some type of clarity of the purpose of mankind in this world and then maybe they will follow along and these are things that we say to beta vel and has some morning when we think of life and the meaning of life because the point of going to a house of mourning is to think of the meaning of life and what, what, what it's all for. As I say to my students very often when I talk about prophecy, I say to them, if God appeared to you once in your life and said, ask me one question, what would that be? I just had that today. That's why I'm thinking of it. So one student says to me, well, I would want to know stock market, what's going to happen? I say, no, you wouldn't. Then another one says, oh, I would like to know what's in the world to come. I don't think you'd ask that. So another one says, whoa, I, I would want to know, um, like, uh, what's going to happen to mankind? I said, I don't think you'd ask that either. I said, anybody else? One guy says, I think I'd want to know why I'm here. He said, that's what you're going to say. You're going to want to know, God, why did you put me in the world? What's my purpose here? Why am I here? <laughs> Give me an idea so that I can receive some type of self-fulfillment and do something meaningful in this world. Tell me why I'm here in the first place. That's what we would want to know. You know, the Talmud says that there were so many prophets, much more than are in the Bible, Twice as many of those who left than those who left Egypt. It's lots of people. But why don't they have books? Why aren't they not in the Bible? So the Talmud of Megillah says, because only prophets who had prophecy 
which was needed for others and for later generations is in the Bible. But prophets who have prophecy for other reasons is not in the Bible. What are the other reasons? That's obvious. The other reasons are prophets who reach prophecy and they said, God, tell me something about why I'm here and what I should be doing in my life. So it wasn't for the whole Jewish people and it wasn't for Egypt and Babylonia like in Jeremiah. And it wasn't for telling the whole people. It was for themselves to try to fulfill themselves as human beings. These people were prophets and that was a question. And that's okay. That's a legitimate question. That's what we all want to know. So we have to keep away from the delusions, from the false messiahs, and try to concentrate on something which makes sense to rectify the world. And that's what Judaism tries to teach us. Shalom. Shalom.